even if I lose everything right now, I still got my skills. Yeah. I can always go back and just be a general surgeon. Everybody always needs a general surgeon. I'll, I'll, I won't go hungry. Right. I don't care what happens. I can start from scratch and I'll get back up there. How to beat the track. Hey, peace family, and welcome to How to Beat the Trap. That's right, I'm your host, Jay Morrison, and welcome to another episode of our amazing podcast where we're going to inspire you with overachievers who have beat some of America's most infamous traps. And today, my guest is Dr. Angelina in the house. Welcome to the Trap Queen. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'm doc, excited. I'm excited. I want to I hear more about all these, all this, all this beauty uh, sauce you got going on. Dr. Angelina um, is a doctor here in Atlanta area, an expanding, um, and is a cosmetic surgeon, right, with IBI Healthcare, uh, such a big company with so many moving parts. She had to actually Google her company name to make sure she got the right one as they are con uh, consolidating their conglomerate. So again, thank you for being a part of the trap. So Dr. Angelina, uh, we define the trap as a program or a system that's designed to entice or entangle you, but secretly for the benefit of another. Such as some of America's most infamous traps, like the college trap that can wrap you up, the corporate trap that can entice and entangle you, mm -hmm. the culture trap, right? Absolutely. And the corner trap in which I came from and survived, right? And so we like to talk to overachievers about their journeys and their paths um, so that we can pull inspiration from that and get actual uh, game and strategies and tools and intangibles to help um, our audience, again, beat these common traps and other traps that might be uh, victim to in their lives. Absolutely. All right? So cool. So. Now that I have you here, we have a, a cosmetic surgeon uh, on how to beat the trap. Um, please tell us, um, mind you, this is your time to shine. This is not the time to be humble. This is your time to talk your talk, as we say. I'll try. All right? And just tell them, um, you know, what you do in full, all the different moving parts of your uh, practice, and, uh, you know, the mission and vision of it, and, and where you guys are going. Sure. So, um as you mentioned, I'm a cosmetic surgeon. Uh, my officially title of cosmetic surgeon came about about five, six years ago. Prior to that, I was a general colorectal trauma surgeon. Hmm. Wait, um, say that again. <laughs> I have many names. <laughs> um, so triple board certification came from general surgery. Uh, general surgery, uh, is, it is a super specialization where we pretty much do everything. You know, your gold appendix, hernias, uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, wow trauma you know when somebody comes in and they got shot you know i was a program director of a trauma program for some point um so we fix people who got trauma from car accidents from whatever wounds they get wow. um, so you're a surgeon surgeon i'm a surgeon surgeon <laughs> um i was uh, my second board certification was uh, critical care uh, that means when those sick people get, end up in icu with those ventilators after they've been shot or had a transplant or had some other major surgical disaster um, i was one of the doctors taking care of them and then eventually we opened up our own practice. Uh, me and my husband, my husband's also a general surgeon, bariatric surgeon, wow. and we moved to Georgia and we started uh, our own practice and grew it from there, which we get into in a minute. Um, and we can go over a couple of different traps that we could fall into <laughs> there. Um, and so that's how Georgia Surgery Care was born, uh, a private practice where we really provide care uh, to people in suburbs, not necessarily big city, because it's easier to find healthcare in a big city. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were out in Monroe, Georgia. <laughs> okay, suburb for sure. <laughs> well, like way past the suburb. Right. Uh, but there's no access to good healthcare out there. So that's how we started. We started with Georgia Surgery Care, grew it, outgrew it. Then I started Surgery Care Arts, which is my cosmetic side of it. And then we grew even further, now opening up in Florida as well. So that's how IBI Healthcare <laughs> was born. <laughs> Uh, but basically, the idea is to provide health care to everyone and not have people run around um, if they're healthy enough and they're on hospital services. Uh, so, for example, my husband can do um, a weight loss surgery on somebody, which my big goal is to educate people about that, how to get healthy using surgical techniques as well. And then they can come back to me afterwards and I can take care of their skin issues because that's a big self-esteem problem for people to have 
all that extra skin or after having kids and having you know mommy restorations gotcha. um so we kind of package it as one big place and people can really just be with us for many years and we can take care of them wow so from there we grew and grew and grew and that's how the name is changing <laughs> awesome <laughs> As you were saying all that, I just had like dollar signs and money bags like popping in my head. It was like ching ching ching. Healthcare ching. is a little different, you know. <laughs> okay. First ching 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 ching, you gotta pay off your student loans. <laughs> that trap. <laughs> yes, medical school trap. That's you know, it's a little bigger than your undergrad. <laughs> right. Um, but yes, if you play it smart and use the resources in the community, um, and investors, and uh, providing good care, and you're not trying, we're not trying to get rich for one person. You know, we're not right. trying to do that. I'm not saying we're not there to make money. I got, a, I got loans to pay, like right. everybody else. But we're not trying to overcharge people like right. hospitals do. So hospitals, you know, they trap people. They can do the same surgery we do, but they charge 60% more, 100% more. Wow. Um, so we're really trying to streamline everything. Gotcha. To make it available to more people, to so make healthcare available to more people, quality healthcare. Quality healthcare, kind of a boutique service boutique service good health care with highly trained surgeons uh, both me and my husband train at clinic clinic which is one of the best in the country um, everybody was making fun of us they're like really you're going from this huge basically a city of a hospital to a two operating room hospital like in monroe georgia where the hell is monroe georgia right <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we did it you know Awesome, awesome, awesome. I want to get into a little bit of that. So like, so, so, I see where you're at today, right? You're expanding now to Florida, multiple states, multiple divisions and verticals within the business, really maximizing the opportunity and, and your, your gifts and your skills. I see that you mentioned kind of the vision and mission to provide affordable health care um, and high level quality health care to, to, to individuals who normally wouldn't be able to probably receive it. Correct. Um, so let's back up, right? So when we go into the trap, um, before we just plow into the trap, we like to reverse engineer and really. There were so many traps. Up, yeah, and find out. So let's talk about um, your upbringing. Let's talk about where you started. Sure. Um, in, in life, and um, you know, where were you born, and, and what was uh, growing up like? What was upbringing like? Um, I grew up in a small town outside of Moscow, kind of like Monroe, Georgia, but in Moscow. Right. <laughs> um, outside of um, a city, same kind of couple hours away by car or, or train. Uh, my parents are not doctors. My father is a welder. My mom is a, st a school teacher, Russian language teacher, so was pretty useless in America <laughs> as far <laughs> as the comp you know um, occupation. And we moved here as refugees. I'm Jewish, so of course there was a lot of persecution back there, and you know my family had opportunity to move here uh, when I was 15. How old were you? Oh, I was 15. 15 when you moved. Well, 15. I when I was growing up, I had no pressure. My parents were very. I don't know if it's me or them because. I have two other sisters, and I know they guide each of us differently. I was very independent from the start, so I kind of did my own thing. Nobody gotcha. ever told me you have to go to college. However, there was never doubt in my mind. I w that there was not a question that I would not go to college. Gotcha. So it was like an automatic thing that I know would happen because pretty much most of my relatives went to college that I knew. Um, so were you the oldest, youngest, or middle? I'm the screwed up one. I'm middle. Oh, man. Jeez. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, middle child. And was the motivation to go to college because of the relatives? Was that no, kind of the environment? No, it's just, it or? was never, it was just kind of the thing that's going to happen. It's kind of like you're a kid and you're going to kindergarten. Next thing you know, you're going to go to first grade. Like, there's never a question in your mind, like, should I go to first? No, you're going to go to first grade. Like, it was just, it was a thing in my head that, you know, I'm that's gonna. What I'm do. Go that's what I do. Right. Um, I never had plans of like pretty weddings or birthday parties or, you know, like none of the girly dreams, like the way people like to think about it. I think mm -hmm. being a girl is another trap. Like people have different expectations from girls. Mm. We were raised more like boys. My father was, you know, like most men in Russian military. Mm -hmm. It was just like, you know, you do things like he, like, okay, you know, three seconds to get ready. Right. <laughs> Are you going to stay home? <laughs> Real, real so strict. we were not necessarily strict, regiment, just though. regiment, yeah, and and then we never been. Uh, my parents never told me like you, the girl, you should clean up the house and cook, and or you're not gonna find yourself a man, right? Like never. 
Wow. If somebody tried to tell me that, I'll be looking at them like, you're just weird. <laughs> like, how's that? Like, how's that related to me <laughs> in gotcha. any way? But <laughs> that's, that's a trap that girls fall into. That's right. another thing that you can think about as a trap because a lot of women grow up with this expectation, you know, men go to work and do this thing, but girls stay at home and have babies and I don't know what girls do. Clean. <laughs> I don't do any of this. I don't cook. I don't clean. I do right. have babies. Okay. But, you, you know, got, you that's later on in life. I didn't know how it happened, I guess. Um, so, ne you know, we never had that expectation that we have some girly um, things we had to do. So did you know in high school that you wanted to be a doctor? Not necessarily, because when I moved to America, <laughs> when I was in Russia in high school, or whatever we called high school, I knew I'm going to move to America. So I didn't make any plans in Russia. Gotcha. Because I was like, well, we'll be moving, so I'll have to start all over again. I moved here, I didn't speak English. So I had to go back to high school, even though I already finished high school once, to learn English. Mm. And so then I was kind of like, what medical school are you talking about? I cannot put like two words together in the right. sentence. <laughs> so once I got better with English, then, you know, I improved. And with every year, you know, I was like, well, maybe I'll, I knew it was something medical. I was like, maybe I'll go do occupational therapy. And then, oh, maybe physical therapy. And as you take more classes, English improves. And it's kind of, oh, well, Maybe I'll try to study for this pharmaceutical school, pharmacy school, and maybe dental school. Well, never mind, I'm going to medical school at the end. <laughs> you know, so it kind of grew on me as my English improved. Gotcha. Um, the traps in that situation that I've missed, that I compared myself to other immigrant kids, or mm. it doesn't necessarily immigrant, the college trap. Some parents are very strict. You have to go to this school only, or we're not going to pay for it. Right. You know, I had a friend whose parents were very insistent on her going to the Ohio State. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so I grew up there okay. um, after Russia. Um, so they were very insistent, like, you're going to go to this four-year university. You have to get into the Ohio State. And I was like, I'm not going to do well in Ohio State University right now with the 600 people in the class when I barely can speak. Right. So I went to community college. Mm. I found a cheaper way out because I had to pay for it myself. I had to work two jobs to pay for whatever I did. Boston Market to start with. <laughs> I was five seventy five an hour, you know. Right, grinding. Uh, but you know, Columbus State, which is a community college, was way cheaper. So I did a couple of years there. I did what I could, and then transferred all my credits to Ohio State. I avoided taking the SATs and SATs, which I knew at the time I wouldn't pass. And then the last two years of my major, I did at Ohio State, which my English was better. I was just specializing in my biology, whatever my degree was at the time, to. And you know, make many, it happen. And how many years were you in the U.S. at that time? Were you were transferring going to Ohio State? I moved here um, when I was 15. I started college at 16. So two years later, when I was 18, I transferred to Ohio State. And I graduated when I was 20. Okay. So even though I lost a little time with the whole English fiasco and doing an extra year of high school, I still kind of made up the time. Awesome. Um, and so at that time, you kind of knew you wanted to go into medical as you were going into So Ohio by the State. end of the Ohio State, then, yeah, I was pre-med, and I, I was planning to go to med school. But still, I was not going. I actually took another year off afterwards. Not off. I still took, like, extra classes, even though I graduated. <laughs> I went to DeVry, did electrical engineering. I did weird stuff for a year, thinking how I'm going to take that MCAT, because my English was still not good enough to write all the essays, mm. to do certain things with English. And so no SAT though going through college. Uh uh. So you just got through community college, grinded your way out. through. And then when it came to um you going over to Ohio State, um, you paid your way through that as well? Mm-hmm. Yes. Was that just working jobs, family? Working jobs the whole time. Working no scholarships with I mean I didn't speak English. There's not many scholarships you can get. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, no, I just worked and I paid. If I took any loan, it was maybe like $5,000 at some point at the end, um, but nothing major. Gotcha. And, of course, school back then was cheaper, and I was in state, you know, state school. Right. But it was good school and had good names, so, but I avoided that trap of comparing to my girlfriend that I was mentioning, whose parents were insistent on her going to mm. four-year college. She struggled, you know, she couldn't pass certain classes. She didn't get the straight A, right. so her chances of getting into a higher degree, if, if, for example, if she wanted to go to medical school, I don't think she did, but you know, it decreases your chances to get into a good medical school afterwards if your GPA was low. Right, and a lot of times the, the college trap is also part of the culture trap, right? It's, it's the parents' peer pressure 
sometimes that oh, says, your child's not going to go to that school. Right, right. Because of prestigious name or because of right. And uh, that's keeping up with other families and all that, as opposed to saying, hey, l let's figure out what's best for you to get the kind yeah. of education you want to best prepare you for life as outside of other people's opinions. Absolutely. And I think that was part of that drive from that girl. Her parents were like, well, what would people say? You know, you're going to this school. My child's not going to go to this school. It's a school. It right. gets you from point A to point B because the first two years of college, what, English, math, like basic math, you know, right. stuff you want to know. <laughs> exactly. <Right. laughs> I did that. I, I passed that class. Right, okay. The first two years, and I stopped partying when I went to Ohio State. Um, fake IDs and all that. All that. <laughs> <laughs> Says the doc. <laughs> hey, I got it out of my system before medical school. Good, good, good. But... You know, I found a way. And then finally, when I did go to medical school, I actually went to medical school without taking MCAT. <laughs> wow. Not really possible anymore these days. But uh, back then, the schools in Caribbean, they have, you know, we have a lot of medical schools in Caribbean, the offshore medical school. Uh, not all of them have better reputation, you know, than other school. They mm -hmm. still don't. American school still considered to be better. Uh, but uh, the one I chose, Ross University, was one of the older school and more known, and right now it's well known around. And so at the time, they just start requiring MCAT. That's a test to enter medical school. Okay. But again, I was so scared to take it because I was like, I don't want to fail it, and I, and I have to study for it. And this opportunity came. Somebody else was applying. I said, you know, let me try. And they called, well, you have to have an MCAT. I was like, look. If I'm going to start studying for MCAT right now, which is now is like November, MCAT is in April, I'm, I'm going to apply to American Medical School. If I'm going to spend this time studying, right. you either take me now or I'm not going to go to your school. And they took me. Wow. So you didn't <laughs> negotiate your way in a... In a medical school, <laughs> right. So then um, I did, I lived in Dominica for two years, which is uh, not Dominican Republic. It's a smaller island, mm -hmm. less known. And I survived. <laughs> <laughs> It's not an easy island to live on. Gotcha. And then, you know, moved here and finished up medical school here. So I found my way around all those things that you can get trapped in, like the names of the colleges, the expectations of people. Wow. Oh, my God, you didn't go to this school. I don't care. I made it to Cleveland Clinic, didn't I? Right. So you, 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 you really um, were resilient and very resourceful. And, and, and I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I didn't have a guidance. I didn't have counselor. It's just kind of like, oh. That looks good. I'll go do this. Right. And so you hit a brick wall or something that didn't seem like it, it pivot would be a pivot. And go to another way, you know, find a way around it. Gotcha. So where'd you end up going to medical school in the U.S. after that? Uh, well, it's the same school. It's uh, the programs in Caribbean. You do the basic science, which is the, you know, the classroom mm -hmm. in the island. And then all the clinical work we do here. Okay. So the two years of clinicals going through the hospitals I did here in the U.S. It's part of the hospital gotcha. system. A hey, Peace Family Real Estate Pioneer, Jay Morrison, coming to you live from the Black House. Uh, why haven't you got your first of its kind video textbook, excuse me, interactive video textbook experience, the 12-step real estate crash course? This book will make you a real estate power player in real life with over six and a half hours of video lessons with 290 pages of real workbook experiences, tests, quizzes, assessments that give you the skill set, mindset, and formulas needed to dominate in real estate and be a power player in any part of the industry in real life. Homeowner, realtor, wholesale, landlord, flipper, developer, don't matter. You need this book. Your family needs this book. Go tap into the link right now for your, for your interactive, first of its kind, video textbook experience in real life. Tap in. 12stepvideotextbook.com. All right, so you graduate medical school, then what? Then went to residency. That's how medical education works. Medical okay. school doesn't give you actually the most useless degree in America is MD. Uh, you cannot do anything with it. Like literally nothing. <laughs> nothing. Until you do residency. Yeah. There's yeah. plenty of doctors in the US who graduated medical school and they cannot get a job. They cannot work as a nurse. They cannot work as physician assistant. They cannot like work, n like work like nothing. It's a complete waste of money until you get your residency and yeah. at least do a year in residency. Gosh, it's like kind of intern hours, if you will. So intern, yeah. So yeah. internship is the first year of residency and for general surgery residency is five years. Mm. You, you did that five years? Of course, yeah. So to become a general surgeon, you do five years of residency. Um, that's basically you work in the hospital as a doctor. You, you know, you are a doctor, but you're not working independent. You work under other doctors. Mm. So first year, you, you know, intern, so you kind of run around and do more paperwork than operating. <laughs> um, but you learn a lot, and then you kind of gradually get introduced to more and more 
uh, complex tasks and eventually surgeries and procedures and so on and so forth. That sounds responsible. I, I, I feel a little more comfortable now about my surgery. Like, <laughs> had to go through some things. The trial. I had to period. go through some things. Yeah, and it's five years in human years. Um, I call it about fifteen years back in the day in surgeon years, because we used to work hundred twenty hours a week easily. Uh, that includes some studying and whatever mm. else we had to do for all our other testing we still have to do during residency. Uh, nowadays they cap them at eighty, but back then it was still. I would say about 15 years of surgeon years. <laughs> wow. So, okay, you get through your residency. Then I did a fellowship. What's that? I never even That's heard That's an that. extra year of training for critical care. So okay. uh, if you see like a colorectal surgeon, vascular surgeon, cardiothoracic surgeon, or whatever other subspecialties, that's additional training doctor has to do. Mm. Usually several years, one to three years of additional training on top of their primary specialty. So I did that. So you were just, you were grinding school. You were, you yeah. were, you were, you were literally leveraging. You, 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 at that point, you knew who you want to be? Like well, I mean, at this point, you were the surgeon. Like, once you started general surgery residency, you're a surgeon. You're like, I'm in. Yeah, you might not be operating on your own, and you probably wouldn't want anybody to operate on you in that early stage by themselves, except unless it's like a little procedure. But, you know, after five years, I'm a, I'm a surgeon. And gotcha. so the extracurricular care, I felt like it's going to give me more independence and just more knowledge for when I move out into different system, uh, or wherever I go, you know, they need trauma and critical surgeons everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. So it was an additional training I chose to do to feel comfortable with it. Gotcha, so how many year, total years of school was that in, in, in residency and fellowship? I didn't do math, PhD. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on, four years, four years, that's eight, plus five, 13, 13 and I did two years of fellowship altogether, so, so 15. 15. So 15 years of schooling, honing your craft and trade. Now, how are you surviving and living through all this time? You broke. Just broke. Well, in medical school, I took loans. Okay. Uh, so medical school, to me, after graduation, because what happens, you take loans, because you cannot work during medical school. You just study the mm -hmm. whole time. There's no possibility of working. Um, so I took a lot of student loans on very high interest rates, probably 11% interest rate, because I had nobody to call sign for me. To get that money. So by the time you graduate, it's, it's adding up. And they give us about three years of loan, for, not forgiveness, but loan um, forbearance, forbearance mm -hmm. once you do your residency. They don't care that your residency is five years and you're not making money after the third year. They want their money back. Mm. So you start paying it off. And so as a resident, I think they paid us back then like 39000 to start with for the year of work. Uh, which sounds okay for some people, but then remember you're working 120 hour shifts, right? You, you're working triple the you amount. Work, yeah, so it's less than it. minimal yeah. wage actually, <laughs> if you calculate the hours. And then at the third year when the student repayment starts to go in, and that was like $1,100 a month, your paycheck is basically gone between the car payment, the house payment and the loan. So there was a couple of years, like my second and third year of residency, I probably had like $2 a day for food. I had no food. Wow. My sister came in the house and she was like, like she came to visit me from Columbus. I lived in Cleveland for residency. My sister lives in Columbus. She came to visit me once in a while. She opens up the fridge like, is that the milk I bought for you four months ago? I'm like, yep, still there. It was obviously no, like a spoiled milk. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the only thing in the fridge the whole time. Like right. I had no, no money to buy food. So what kept you motivated during that time? Well, you have no choice. You gotta finish it. Well, you got a choice you can quit. You can't, cause you're stuck with the loans. So you're invested. <laughs> well, you, you're very invested because you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Once you finish this, you'll be able to make some money back gotcha. and pay it off. All right, so you got through the 15 years of schooling and training, and then what was your first you know, real-world experience after that? So what we did, because my husband was there too, he was one year ahead of me. So were you guys married then? We got married in 2009. So we were together for a few years. We waited for him to graduate his residency, and then we got married. Gotcha. So, so, so you graduated residency first? He got, a, he, he got out one year ahead of me. Okay, gotcha, ahead of you, excuse me. And then um, he stayed as a surgeon at Cleveland Clinic, one of their hospitals, gotcha. to, to wait for me to finish my residency and then my fellowship. And you guys met? At, at the college? residency, yeah, Okay. in the training. And um, after we finished, I interviewed with Cleveland Clinic again, but they were offering very low pay because it's very standard. That's another trap for doctors. They hire new grads at quite low mm. pay for doctor. Um, and he was like, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> he got the business gene. 
and he got his MBA afterwards too. And so that's how I ended up in Georgia because everybody's like, how did you end up in Georgia from Ohio? I have nobody here. I don't know anybody here. I have no relatives here. <laughs> but your husband was like, we're going. We're going somewhere. So we're Texas, Florida, and somebody called us, some of the recruiters, and they're like, we need surgeons in this area. I'm like, okay, we'll check it out. But you have to have two because we have two surgeons. We come together right. as a package. And that's how I end up in a little hospital, middle of nowhere. Gosh, and now were you guys doing that as like independent contractors or you're actually working for the hospital as employees at that time? Neither. Neither? So the way that worked, um, hospitals in rural communities, because uh, Monroe is more rural, mm -hmm. uh, they have this thing with government where they bring doctors on, they can do income guarantee for the first year. So they say, you're not employed by us, you're affiliated, uh, affiliated with us, but you have to work in this area for three years in the zip code. And the first year, let's say we just opened up our first practice, right? We have no money coming in. Nobody knows about us. We have no, no patients. We made zero money the first month, let's say. They'll supplement us to make sure we get a certain amount of salary that first month. Right. It's coming from the government, really. Um, next month, we might make $5,000. That means they'll give us the other $5,000, for example. Yep. So, so they supplement it, and hopefully by the end of the year, you even doubt where you don't need their money anymore. So, and that money gets forgiven at the end of the three years once you serve that area for three years. So hospitals is generally what they hope for. Either you're gonna leave so they can bring more surgeons in or more doctors in because they get, the CEO of the hospital actually gets paid for bringing more people in. Mm. So for him, the interest is you fail and get the hell out so he can bring more people right, in. Right, get a bigger check. <laughs> or you get employed by the hospital because you cannot, you know, cannot sustain your own practice, which is very common with doctors because they have no business sense, and you fail, and they hire you, and then they can tell you what to do. Mm. And we didn't do either. <laughs> okay, so you beat that trap. <laughs> we didn't fail, and we didn't get employed, and we just grew. <laughs> and so, yeah, we ended up staying in the area and setting up nice little, um, well, not little, big office. <laughs> it's 19,000 square foot office. So you guys stay for, so you, you had the three years, right? Yeah, we're in still the there. We still gotcha. have, we're still there. So you, got the left. so you got the forgiveness on the, any subsidies or Yeah, or I mean, you pay your taxes and all yeah. that stuff, but yeah. But then you, begin, then you grew your practice from that momentum. We grew that practice from that momentum. And um, the trap that a lot of doctors fall into, they feel like they have to operate in the hospital, that they owe hospital something. They don't. Mm. Um, that you have to only advertise to patients who have insurance. That's a, a very common thing with every marketing company we try to hire. Uh, that we try to market to the areas that have the zip codes, you know, they can pull all that data from the marketing places. Right. Um, advertise to people who have like good insurance, right? You have good insurance here, good. I was like, I don't want their insurance. Advertise, you know, like north of Gwinnett County where nobody has insurance, go there. Mm. But like, why? I'm like, those people need healthcare too. And they do, and they come. Wow. And they make you concerned that they'd have the, the, the money to pay bills or, or make payments or and all that? For, for the services, yeah. That the people you were advertising to. Well, they have to pay cash. <laughs> so it's upfront. You want this? You got to cash out. That's how it works everywhere else in the world. Right. Um, problem with insurance is they're unpredictable. You know, you uh, when people come to the hospital and we noticed it, and we tried to fight it, but you can't fight with the hospital, right? The huge system. As one doctor, you're gonna get in trouble. Um, if you have the uh, some gallbladder, you, have you heard of gallbladder? Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get them out. But if it's not bad enough to kill you, you're gonna go to the hospital if you don't have insurance or you have Medicaid. They'll scan you, they'll get a CAT scan in the emergency room. They'll mm -hmm. give you some medicine and they'll say, surgeon said, it's not life-threatening. Here's some antibiotic, here's some pain pills. Go follow up with the surgeon as outpatient. And then you get that bill from ER for like what, two, $3,000? Yep, and you're like, I'm not, going to <laughs> I'm not going to see the surgeon because I don't know how much he's gonna charge me, right? And so a month later, same thing happens. You come back to ER, they scan you. <laughs> they say it's not life-threatening. Here's some pain pills, here's antibiotic. Medical trap. It's a medical trap. And, and we've seen patients who would come in without insurance like every other month. And you look at their list of visits and they've been to ER every other month with the same exact symptom. Like just get the gold bar out. I don't need their payment. I'm just gonna go get it out. Obviously the hospital loses money or they probably get it from the state. At that point, I was like, I just want to get, I just want to help them. I just want to get that go blood out so I don't have to see them every other month in ER. Right. Um, and so that's how our surgery center was born. We built our own surgery center. 
Nice. Because every time we try to take a patient who need the service without insurance to the hospital, we call and say, hey, how much? I want to bring a patient in with no insurance. How much is going to cost them? I know how much I'm going to charge. How much are you going to charge them for that gallbladder surgery? How much is anesthesia going to charge them for that gallbladder surgery? And nobody can give you an answer. Wow. Or they'll come up with like $20,000. I'm like, well, hell with gallbladder, I'll buy a house. <laughs> 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 right? So when we build a surgery center, we can, cal- can control the cost. We can mm. actually say, look, we don't need the hospital here. You can come here and I can tell you exactly how much it's going to cost you ahead of time. No surprise bills. Right. And it's going to be a fraction of the cost that the hospital is going to charge you. Mm, you're the hospital competition. I don't think so. I mean, they get all the sick people. They get people who cannot be operated on an outpatient surgery center, right? right. We have to choose healthier. I mean, th- they might have a problem at the moment, but they're overall healthy person. Gotcha. Uh, sick people go to the hospital, and that's what it should be. Gotcha. Okay. So well, um, you have these different practice focuses, and I know uh, cosmetic is something that we, we talked about. Mm-hmm. So um, let's talk about uh, that focus and what you guys offer in the space of beauty, health, weight loss, cosmetic. Sure. Um, well, see, you put weight loss and cosmetic in one sentence. It's not the same? I, a lot of people confuse it, and that's kind of like my education uh, component here that sure. I have a lot of patients who come in, and how it started. My husband started doing um, what we call them like service lines. You know, we had a heartburn service line, hernia service line, and then we started doing weight loss service line. So that's for patients who need to lose weight, the gastric sleeve, gastric bypass, all those surgeries that you think people know about nowadays. They don't. A lot of people don't know. Um, And once we start having more and more people coming back after the weight loss, they're like, hey, cut off my skin. And I'm like, well, technically I can, but it's, I guess, not my specialty because usually it's the plastic surgeon's job, right? Right. And so for a while, we kept sending those people out (laughs) for cash money to go away. I'm like, what am I doing? (laughs) So that's when I back and did another fellowship. Of course you did. I did another fellowship. (laughs) Um, So I was already five years into my private practice when I went back into fellowship. So I can accommodate those patients and help them. How long a fellowship do you have to do for plastic it, surgery? Well, this is cosmetic surgery, one cosmetic, year. One year, okay. Yeah, on top of my other years before. Right. So now you got 16 in. Well, no, this is 15. The, okay. the original that, that, was 14, that, and the 15th year okay. was that one. And awesome. then my husband said, we're not allowed to do anymore. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that was it. All right, so you guys are keeping those patients now, but you're seeing it, it's, it's a business opportunity that's going going away. Well, it's, it's business and education because I have a lot of patients coming in, let's say, for tummy tuck. And service, too. Yeah. Right, and, and they'll say, I want tummy tuck. Why, do you want, why now? Why tummy tuck now? And they'll say, well, I've tried everything for weight loss and nothing worked. I'm like, so you already had a bypass? They're like, no, what's that? I'm like, well, that's a real weight loss procedure. Mm. <laughs> tummy tuck is the after, after thing. Right. So we do a lot of the education, I feel like, I don't turn patients away. A lot of patients go like, what's your limit? What's, what's the weight limit for me to come and do the surgery? I was like, don't worry about it. Just come in. We'll talk about it. Because I have other services I can help them with. I can educate them and say, this is not right time for you to do tummy right. tuck. It's not healthy. It can kill you. But let's do the weight loss surgery, get you healthy, and then we can come back and do that tummy tuck. So real consulting. Right. right. So I, I do spend time with my patients educating them. And they might not like it because some people don't like to hear it. But I'm not going to take their money and do surgery, then later on they're going to not be happy about or potentially have complications. Gotcha. So I'd rather turn around and say, look, let's do it the proper way. Let's do it the healthy way. From a weight perspective, what's the, the heaviest, if you will, or largest uh, client you've taken on and have service to help? God, I have to ask him. I think one of our first patients, we did gastric sleeve, so that's actual weight loss surgery, not cosmetic surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, I know... If I don't know if you've done large people uh, in a surgery center. We have some limits, but I know we had uh, one guy that I know personal was 425 pounds, and he went down to 220 uh, that last time I checked. But uh, they've probably gone bigger uh, patients uh, that they operate on in the hospital. So gotcha. they have certain, we have certain weight limits that we can do in our surgery center. Gotcha. So from 425 to like 220. Yeah. For a guy who's like six foot tall, yeah. it's really not that bad. Um, so, yeah, we have a lot of stories like that. Uh, but, yeah, people are as big as 450, 400. But, again, those people are not ready for time attack. They're never going to heal. People mm-hmm. don't get that. They're like, I just want to look pretty. I was like, you're not seeing the, the, the whole picture here. <laughs> There's a reason doctors say no. It's not because I don't want to work hard physically, because it is physical work to do the surgery. It's because I want you to heal. 
Right. And, and not in two years. I want you to heal like right right away. Right. And I want you to be happy and not miserable. So we have that kind of conversation and we do whatever we can to help them. Gotcha. To what other kind of cosmetic surgeries do you guys do? So all the mommy makeovers, which generally include like the breast surgery, belly surgery, surgery, uh, transvaginal procedures. I know it's a guy's show here, but hopefully it's for everybody. It's for everybody. Um, but we're trying to normalize female parts and um you know babies do a number down there so part of my mommy makeover i add those procedures too um thigh lifts arm lifts facelifts you know skin tightening so we do pretty up. much the Breaking whole thing to you, what's a transvaginal surgery well we have they're not always surgery they're procedures Procedure. to tighten things okay so very common thing that a lot of women take for like oh that, that's how it is i had a baby so now i will pee every time i sneeze you know mm -hmm. uh, very common problem a huge business um, doing uh, procedures for on overactive bladders or urinary incontinence. Mm. Um, that that happens with you know gravity. That happens with age. That happens with having children. All of that weight sits down on the pelvic floor, and now people have trouble going to the bathroom or holding it in, having sex. Um, as women age, or for example, somebody who had maybe breast cancer, they're not allowed to use certain hormonal supplements. Things drying out. Mm -hmm. um, so we can do procedures to try to rejuvenate tissue so people, women can enjoy their life again. That's so awesome. it's really try to restore women's health. Yeah. And See, I, I asked that and why I do like that is because we have a, a pretty, um, my, my audience is probably more male than female, but we have a pretty high female audience and I just like helping people, right? And you just never know, may not be the most people in the world. It's not always volume, right? So as an educator and a speaker, when I go speak, I say whether well, it's three people or 300, I'm still showing up and showing up the same way. And so I look at this opportunity the same way, right? It right. may not get the most liked views or whatever, be reached the widest audience, but if this podcast helps somebody get healthier or meet a need, I feel like our job is Absolutely, done, right? and, and those are the things people don't talk about. Um, you know, because everybody, mommy makeover, you know, boobs, and I was like, no, that's not mommy makeover. Mm. That's not all kids ruin. Right, <laughs> and, and, and people just get into this, I guess, another trap of assuming just because it's happening, nobody talks about it, nobody asks about it, or we're not allowed to say the word vagina. Um, that means we're not like we have to deal with it for the rest of our lives, right? And people get miserable. And there are things we can do to, uh, we can, there are things we can do to, um, you know, to help women to get their health back and enjoy sexual life and enjoy their traveling and running and playing with kids without worrying what's gonna happen That's down awesome. below. Well. So absolutely, and for the male audience, audience, they can share it with their wives and mothers and whoever is suffering. Right, yeah, That's, I, I so, love but it, there I love are it. Things, you know, same as weight loss, like people don't talk about certain weight loss procedures, same as the female procedures. Yeah. So very knowledgeable, I'm learning and we're awesome. educating. Tell and me if um, I'm going too much into certain subjects because no, some of the stuff, you know, I get I, like so into it and I'm like, I'll be talking about no, it all I day. I want you to be passionate. I want <laughs> you to talk about it. Right now we're going to talk about what I call my trap analysis. Yes. Right. And so as I look at your journey, um, what I really love is when you use the word pivots. I'm a big pivoter, right? If something's not working, right, you make a different pivot, you make a different decision. And I've seen that, um, you know, you were able to leverage the college trap although you had to kind of like get sucked in a little bit to the, to the medical debt, but that was just part of how it's set up. Well, but you have here, no choice if you have that right. profession. But here's the cool part though. Um, Dr. Angelina was able to leverage the college trap by taking on the loans, 11% interest, right? It sucks, it's compounding, all that. All that year, all those years. <laughs> and the corporate trap, they tried to get her enticed and entangled, right? To either work for the hospital or fail but she and her husband were able to leverage those opportunities to create their own practice, right? And multiple verticals in that practice by her being resilient and understanding that she can be an owner of the business and do it, you know, your way, right? And Absolutely. so I think that was a great thing. A lot of people do get sucked into what's the norm. So that's what the trap is, right? We say a program or a system designed to entice or entangle you, but secretly for the benefit of another, another that uh, hospital play, right? 
the CEO gets in, right? So they make it think it's about you, right? So we're gonna give you a stipend or some kind of subsidy if you come on. And yes, guess what, young doctors? For the first three years, you can, you know, get this stipend or for the first year and it's not, it's not repayable. And it feels like it's all for you. Like, wow, they're looking out for me. They're helping me out as, as, a, as a new doctor. Absolutely. But secretly, it's for the benefit of the CEO who's like, hey, if you fail, I get a new, a new person in and I get more money. And success looks like you working for me. And so you were able to leverage that to your own benefit as opposed to being entangled and not being able to get out of that trap. So I want to commend you for Thank beating you. The, uh, the medical trap and using it to your advantage and now empowering others, right, in, in, this, in this journey. So I want to commend that. Um, that's my trap translation for, for Dr. Angelina. And now we're going to uh, segue into your trap transition. And what that is, is I like to ask you, was there an aha moment along your journey, even going into that kind of medical trap where you saw, knew, had a revelation, epiphany or anything, they're like, wait, we could do better, but you and your husband, yourself, et cetera, like there's another way to do this and the route they got us going on, that ain't the way. Was there like an aha moment somewhere along the way where you, you realized that? I mean, for me, I think it came a little later before my, I mean, my husband, I think, got that aha moment ahead of me because he's the one who was pushing for us to get out of the hospital system. If not for him, I probably would still be trapped in one of those big hospital, con you know, huge systems. Mm -hmm. Just being a good little girl and doing what, what you're <laughs> told because that's what they do. They make you think like there's no other way to do this. Right. Every doctor we interview, they're like, wait, you're doing what? H how are you doing it? So we're going to go meet all the doctors. I was like, well, no, we're done meeting all the doctors. Not, I'm not advertising to doctors anymore. You know, doctors can only send me so many patients. No, I'm advertising to people. Right. You know, I'm going directly to consumer and they cannot compute. Like how you mean you're not operating through insurance anymore? No, we're not doing that. Right. Um, out of the system. Out of system. And right now, you know, with the doctors who operate in the hospitals, hospitals are required to take calls. So at night when somebody calls, like somebody comes in with appendix or gallbladder or gunshot wound, there has to be a doctor on call, surgeon who can take care of it. Hospitals cannot run without surgeons. Right. And we do it for free. So if somebody comes in without insurance, we take care of them. We get zero compensation. Mm. No hospital, no patient. Obviously, most patients cannot compensate for those uh, big surgeries. Um, so it's a trap in a way that like they make it sound like you have to do it. You operate in here. So for the privilege of bringing your patients in here for us to take all their money through <laughs> insurance, now you also owe us that call. Wow. That's usually uncompensated. You owe us your time. Your, you, you owe us your uncompensated on-call time. Correct. And most hospitals, I mean, right now, maybe they, they, some hospitals, maybe some doctors will get some compensation. But as a private practitioner, I'm not employee of the hospital. I'm not, you know, I just affiliated. They allow me to use the operating room, but there's no money going exchange, uh, nothing going back and forth. So it was like a thing that we had to do. And so when I did my cosmetic surgery fellowship and we already have our own surgery center, I pulled my call out. I said, I don't, I don't need this anymore. Mm. That was the how moment. Don't call me. <laughs> well, yeah, I just pulled myself, you know, from the schedule and I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And of course there was a lot of, you know, when we did it with my husband, well, he did it too. Um, there was a lot of, what do you mean? I'm like, well, that pretty much what I just said. No more call. We out. <laughs> and now when, you know, even um, a lot of the Facebook groups where I talk to some surgeons and they're like, what do you do? I'm like, I just stopped taking call. They're like, how, 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 how did you, how did you do that? I'm like, well, you build a surgery center, you have your own place to go operate, you don't owe anybody to anybody. Right, I you got just, my own tables. I got, I got my, my own, own center. I got my own center. I, I go do surgery right there. So, Oh, that, so I get it now. Most doctors don't have their own center, so you need the hospital center. The hospital's saying, yeah, use our center. Yeah. But in exchange, you got to be, you got to be on call for us. You got to be on call for us. Exactly. Wow. That's such a play but for you, them. But they also mentioned that there's certain laws that guided that you were not allowed to compensate you for it. It's against the law. <laughs> to compensate you for right. hours of your time. That right. You However, invested all these you can bring into. all the patients you want uh, to our operating room, which insurance will compensate them way more than doctor would ever get. Um, give you example, a hernia repair, like chiral hernia repair. Doctor, surgeon who did all the workups, seen the patient, follows through for many weeks afterwards, right? Did whatever they had to do, take care of the patient, bring him to that hospital, might get $1,000. The hospital will get $30,000 for just that one couple hour surgery. Anesthesia will get something else. Anesthesia never leaves the hospital, right? They just sit there. 
the system. But the doctor is the one who's gonna do all the work before and after, and if there's any complications, any complaints, you know, there's always something. Um, doctor's office is dealing with it, not the hospital. Wow. So we brought millions of dollars worth of surgeries into their center because we're already pulling patients from right like, you're, you're, from, you're patients we well, had patients coming in from marietta down to monroe georgia for surgery into that little hospital and they were complaining I'm like really those patients don't know where monroe is they don't know where loganville is <laughs> they come no in from does. all over <laughs> exactly <laughs> we have those patients driving hour and a half two hours flying out from other states to come to this little hospital and you're gonna give me crap I'm like, we're not doing it anymore. So aha moment was I was said, no more call. Don't wake me up at night. Wow. Take control of your own destiny. Yes. I it's, love it. I need to open me awesome. up the hospital. <laughs> when you've been awake every night for like years and not get paid for it half the time. <laughs> Jeez, that's the hustle hustle, man. Jeez. <laughs> then you're like the system. Done. Awesome. Good for you for breaking free. All right. So now I got to put you in what we call a trap seat. The trap seat is kind of our hot seat. Oh, yes. And we do a segment called trap blown, right? It's where we kind of blow up the trap. Okay. And so I'm going to ask you a couple of different questions. Not too heavy, but a little heavy. All oh right. My God. So the first one is, um, is there a moment during your career um, or your journey that um just is an amazing moment like where you just like unbelievable to you you're like i can't believe like i've accomplished this that we've accomplished it that i've done this that i've met this person i've been here something you wish afforded to do in life from from your, your works and your efforts what's like a mind-blowing moment of something like just you know the girl from the small town two hours from moscow russia who came over to the states who could be, couldn't speak any english who went through 15 years of school but now i had this amazing opportunity or thing happen in my life well, we built down an opportunity, but right now, I think, I think me and my husband were talking just a few weeks ago, um, kind of like just looking at everything that we built. You know, have hundreds of employees. We have four surgery centers. Wow. Um, got a few cars. I have. A, I might have a shoe and car problem. <laughs> um, follow me on Instagram for shoes. <laughs> um, but you know, just kind of looking back, and you know, we have three kids. Um, I end up having, by the way, two little kids during the whole time in Georgia. So <laughs> the, the second fellowship was, was still breastfeeding and just kind of looking back at it, it was just the whole picture. Like, like we'll be all right. Like there's nothing else. Whatever else happens, it doesn't matter. Like we'll be okay. Right. And it's, it's not because we have a lot of money, you know, we invest everything back into our centers, but even if I lose everything right now, I still got my skills. Yeah. I can always go back and just be a general surgeon. Everybody always needs a general surgeon. I'll, I'll, I won't go hungry. Right. You know. You got experiences. We got experiences. You, got you know, basically at this point is where you can say, I don't care what happens. I can start from scratch and I'll get back up there. And that's and a good feeling, right? That's freedom. That's a good fe that, That's the freedom. It's right. not just like you not counting every penny. I'm not saying I'm spending crazy or doing anything like that. But it's not about a number. It's not about number. It's more just knowing like I'm comfortable. I got what I need. And then if everything goes to crap, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay to get back up. Yeah, that's how I think too. So think you'll like, be able to- Cause I know life can happen. And life, I, and that's, I keep telling my happen. patients, don't use that as an excuse for gaining weight. Yeah. Corona happened, you know, something else happened, car accident happened. It can happen. There's always gonna be, like you basically expectation, something's always gonna happen. Mm. And then just knowing that whatever happens, you'll figure it out. So you said a couple hundred employees? I think we had a hundred something. A hundred something I don't employees? know anymore. But over a hundred employees? Something, yeah. So many you don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that I'm the CEO. Employees. That many employees. Yeah, comfortable. Because I, until about four years ago, I did all the payroll myself. I did QuickBooks for like 20 oh. entities myself. Wow. With all reconciliations I'm definitely, I'm and definitely a bookkeeper in that out. I'm definitely... I, I held it close. So on the weekends when I'm not operating, I was like in the office going through all the checks. Wow. Whatever. Doing reconciling controls, all that. I don't know why I did it. I, I don't know why I didn't give it up quicker. <laughs> so I just gave it up. So as soon as I gave up the payroll, I don't ask me how many employees I have. Gotcha. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> right. Enough. All right. So tell us about though two of the cars you have. So you got some cars. Just two? Just tell us, tell, okay, tell me about, tell me about four of them. <laughs> go ahead, so, you go. <laughs> okay, the, the, my, well, the baby, 
It's like 2016. It's the the AMG, the GTS AMG. Nice. That's that's my favorite one. That's your favorite one? Yeah, because I always wanted to have like a sports car. I mean, I was a car fanatic before I had any money, um, but we had a surgeon that actually worked for us at some point. And you know, here we are working hard, putting all money back. You know, I'm not paying myself too much. I was like kind of you know whatever we paid basic salary and then just put it back all mm -hmm. in the building. And this guy we hired, he's having good life. He's going out out of town every weekend. <laughs> he living better than you. <laughs> he got like a regular SUV, and then he got himself a Porsche. I'm like, honey, <laughs> how much is that car? <laughs> so I got my, you know, I, I I convinced him that we should share a car. Mm -hmm. So we got like one that's a little upgrade from regular Porsche. So that was the AMG, and then um, which other one? I mean, I, I the 911 is nice. 911. Sweet. The Turbo S. <laughs> you like fast cars. We, we got a few fast cars and then, you know, a couple, like the Model X, actually. I have one of those, too. Model X. What's that? Tesla. Tesla. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's my kid's favorite car because they like that one. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right. So now just give me uh, one moment from your life, right, that you can kind of blow yourself up a little bit. So one moment in your life that you regret or embarrassed by that you're like you know what if I could have that moment back or that day back or that decision back I take it back I don't know if I have regrets I learned not to do that I'm not saying there was no embarrassing moments give I'm me, like give me an embarrassing moment well I can't think back now <laughs> I'm so bad at this you're going to get me an embarrassing moment right now. Yes, I want one. I don't care if you like left the bathroom with like toilet paper still in your shoe. Like I want an embarrassing moment. Well, when I was like a little, I've done it. Like <laughs> when I was a baby, like in, in, in school, I, I always do some stupid like that. Um, I can't think of anything. Oh, you're too cool. She's too cool. She has, she's, I'm, she, I'm not saying there's not. Like no, trust I know, me, I, I do know. stupid crap all the time. It's, it's definitely on the spot. <laughs> it's definitely on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. as far as regrets, I mean, I've done stupid stuff. I've been married and divorced. I've done, you know, like I've done maybe not the smartest financial decisions, but I just decided like to not look back and feel regret. The kind of moving forward. Life, though. It is. It's because you can leave, you know, things still happen in my head when I sit night sometimes. I can't sleep because I'm like replaying things that happen. Mm -hmm. But I always say, you know, just let's move on. Like, can't change that. Do better next time. Learning lesson. Let's go. Learning lesson. Let, let's move. Because you're gonna get stuck. You're gonna get depressed. You you know. That's the fact. So. I might change that question up because yeah, I don't want to get caught up in that. You might leave the how to beat the trap and be like all in your head or something like right. Yeah, let's let's stay on the positive side. Yes, yeah, positive side. All right, Sorry. cool. So okay, this is our last segment um, of the trap seat, which is our trap cheat sheet. So this is if you were um, looking at your younger self or and or somebody as um, facing the same uh, traps you faced, whether it be in college, the medical field particularly, mm -hmm. um, and you're talking to a young aspiring doctor out there um, or surgeon out there, uh, what is some advice you would give them to help them um, you know, have a cheat sheet to the trap? Well, in healthcare, actually, I was speaking to a medical student today um, in my office about the, you know, don't believe the hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> don't believe them. Don't believe them. They have all the protocols in place uh, just for reimbursement purposes. Um, Use your own brain, use your own head. If, doesn't, if something doesn't feel right, you know, research it. Mm. Just because don't you're doing it this way. It. Don't, don't accept never it. accept it. And, and the surgery, I would say, never say never. I've had students before, residents under me, I would say, I've never happened, you know, I've never seen this before. I was like, just because you said that, <laughs> that means it's gonna happen. Right. Uh, you know, use your imagination talk to other people, network, and see what other people's doing. Just because somebody's doing something different doesn't mean it's wrong. Mm. It might not be your cup of tea, but it means there's other way of doing stuff. Right. And so for medical professionals, specifically right now with the push to buy out all the private practices and, and just, you know, like Piedmont right now, buying everything out, right? Cleveland Clinic did that in Ohio years ago. Um, everywhere you go, you just one system. you trapped in one mm. place. They trapped the hospitals the same way. They want a monopoly. Over. Exactly. And then they make everybody feel like this is the only way. You can't go outside. You can't. No, you got to stay here and do this this way. And so people can't wrap their head about around like there's another way. Like right. like what we're doing. We're not 
using insurances. We're not using doctors to advertise. You know, step back and look at the big picture. Why are you there? Are you mm. doing what you what you want wanted to do to start with? A lot of doctors get that I'm going to grow up and I'll be a doctor. I'm going to help people, and here they are they're just paper pushers now. <laughs> you know, Call. being told by a hospital what to do, what not to do, which test to do, which not to do. Um, you know, you're not using your brain anymore. Mm. So just just think, step back, look at the bigger picture. Dr. Angelina, a medical revolutionary. Protect this woman at all costs. She is disrupting the medical industry, you and your husband, by doing uh, great work. And I love how you're thinking outside the box. Um, that's what this is all about, is that um, there's so many ways to pursue our careers, pursue our end results. We don't have to be told or influenced just by a culture or by a system or by a program how it should be done. Or title. All that, yeah. Just because your title says something, you just step back and do something else, that's fine. Mm. You could pivot. Pivot. You like that word? Yeah, I love that word. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's important. Some people get stuck on a trajectory and track. They'll never turn to the left, they'll never turn to the right, or they'll never just turn around. They'll just get stuck on one track because they were told they should or they, they could, and they just never, you know, right? So it's like, I think that's so important for all of us to kind of just be fluid. Right. And don't forget the nearest exit is behind you. The nearest exit is behind you, trap bar. Simple <laughs> it's like as the that airplanes. is. The nearest exit is behind you. You ain't even got to go that route. Exactly. That goes for the corner trap, the medical trap, the college trap, the corporate trap. You don't got to get stuck in any of these. Don't get stuck. Systems. Don't get stuck in your specialty. Don't get stuck in. And it doesn't mean you have to go and relearn stuff, or redo everything, you know. There's just so many options. I love it. And that spirit is um, obviously serves you and your family well. So far, so good. So far, so good. All right, says the woman who can't remember how many employees she has right now. Um, so I, I, I didn't know I'm gonna have that question. I would have prepared. No, honestly, I brought statistics. Honestly, I don't know how many I have. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it ain't a hundred. But um, hundred sounds good. It's a yeah, nice round number. It's a nice number. Yeah. I'm like I don't know, a couple dozen, a few dozen, somewhere <laughs> in there. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Angelina, tell everyone where they can um, find your practice, find you, uh, get consultation even for your, your services. Where can they tap in? Sure. Uh, right now, the easiest way is Surgicare Arts um, website and Instagram, surgicarearts.com or surgicarearts on Instagram. Um, and then I have the phone number. I wrote it down. Let's do it. Give it to him. I got a paper. Hotline. Hotline. 423-528-9175. There you go. Call up for your consult, right, for all different um, cares for yourself, men and women. Uh, health concerns, weight loss, beauty, etc. Uh, trauma, you get shot and you're near Monroe, Georgia. You <laughs> Please don't come to me. <laughs> <laughs> so Go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with that. <laughs> but thank you so much for um, visiting the trap and really giving us some high level game um, that can serve so many of us so many well. Even if we're not a medical professional, I think there's a lot of gems and jewels we can pull from Dr. Angelina's journey. And think about it, at 15 years old, she couldn't even speak English. Um, and, so and I'm only 25. Only 25. In 10 years. <laughs> in 10 years, she did a 15-year residency. She is amazing. <laughs> right? So, guys, it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to be able to pull some resource and gain from this in our in, in introspective lives. Um, again, thank you for joining me. And uh, we're going to see how we can get, get some referrals and get some more people over to your practice to, 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 work, to work with you. Thank you for hanging out with us. Thank Family, you. we got some more gems from Dr. Angelina. Um, who is three-time board certified uh, cosmetic surgeon and more who just came in and showed us what a revolutionary, a medical revolutionary looks like in the trap. Thank you guys for uh, tuning into this podcast. Make sure you subscribe on all channels, audio and vis visual. Make sure you share this, give some gain to someone who could, who could need it. And I'll see you next time on our next episode of How to Beat the Trap in real life. Hey, Peace Family, it's Jay Morrison, co-founder of the Legacy Center here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I wanna invite you all to be a virtual member of our building, our Class A office space, also known as the Black House. 
from anywhere in the world who can house your business here in Atlanta, Georgia, and have your virtual address be our address. Get your own suite number. You also can get our virtual notary services, our virtual receptionist services, have a telephone line for your team, and get access to our meeting rooms, conference rooms, and get one day per month to actually visit our building and house your business here in real life. Family, this opportunity is just $40 per month or $300 for the year, a super discount for you to be able to have a Class A office space house your business address two miles from Tyler Perry Studio, five minutes from the world's busiest airport right here in amazing Atlanta, Georgia at LegacyCenter.com.